Thanks for joining us for another episode of Articulations. We're here today with artist, uh, painter, printmaker, historian, and a whole bunch of other titles, artist Curly Raven Holton. Thank you for joining us, Curly. Oh, well, I'm honored to be here with you, Eileen. It's, it's a special privilege and a pleasure to interact with you and your, your uh, audience, your supporters. So let's start pretty much at the beginning. When did you know you were going to be an artist? Well, I wasn't, I didn't know I was going to be one because I didn't know what it meant to be one. But I started doing artistic work when I was a kid. I, my brother is an artist, not a practicing artist, but was artistic, my older brother. So I used to watch him as a kid over his shoulder and try to mimic him, you know. So that was how I got involved with that. And then in school, my teachers discovered that I could draw horses or a portrait of Abraham Lincoln or something like that. And I would receive some uh, recognition for that, some little awards in class. And then I realized that the, the girls in class liked it a lot, too. <laughs> so I used it as a, 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 my, my dating uh, uh, <laughs> book, you know what I'm saying? And uh, so it was always something I did along with everything else, but I never had a clear sense of uh, that I wanted to be an artist. I was not around professional artists. I had... And, uh, encountered any other than my teachers who were clearly not practicing artists necessarily and I remember saying this uh, insulting one of my teachers and I, I always regret that I did this I said those that do can do and those that can't teach yeah and that was that was a mistake to have said that and again uh, uh, showing your love of my immaturity and lack of exposure so I really didn't embrace this notion of being an artist probably until I went got drafted in the military in, in 1971. I was drafted at the end of Vietnam. And in the military, there was a competition, arts competition called the Fifth Army Arts Competition. I entered and won the prize. And at the reception <clears throat> for the show, a colonel approached me and said, look, you know, I think I was a specialist for class at that point. And uh, the colonel said, look, if you want, I can have you reassigned to this art center on campus that works with returning GIs from Vietnam that have drug problems. I said, yeah, that would be great because, you know, then I wouldn't have to shave. I could grow my beard. <laughs> I wouldn't have to salute officers. You know, I could get up a little later, you know. <laughs> and so I said, yes. Yeah. So I started doing that and I, I, I continued to paint while I was in the military, just on the weekends, and there were a couple other creative people there. There was a young man that made grandfather clocks, but he made them in the custodian's closet. Because you really, you know, you have open barracks. You don't have a private space. And I was inspired by this idea that this, no matter what, this young man was making his work, and so I did continue to do art. But it wasn't until a little later on I was at Ford Motor Company, and I was working as a supervisor in management, and I had a anxiety attack one day. I thought I was having a heart attack. So I went to the doctor. He said, no, no, you're all right. You're just having a little anxiety attack. The anxiety attack was because I emotionally did not want to be in that environment. I wanted to be, I wanted to make art. Okay. But in a practical sense, just as we talked with Michael, I right. couldn't do that because, you know, I had children and a family and I wanted to support them. So I was having this conflict. So it took me many years to get to the point where I could, I could create a situation that allowed me economically to pursue the arts full time as a student. And I was what they call a Ben Arrow. So it took me 10 years to get through undergraduate school going part time at night. And then, you know, then on to graduate school. But it took me quite a while to get to that place. So I was in class with uh, students that were 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, and I was, you know, 24, 25, 28 years <laughs> old. But I, that didn't bother me right. because I was, I was uh, uh, committed to doing this. And it does bother, it, it could bother some individuals. They couldn't be in that same kind of space as, as so adults. So where did you get your formal art training? I studied, I did my, I went, when I got out of the military, I went to a local community college to study business. I wanted to be a businessman. And I met a, I think I was the only African American in my class, and I met, I took one art class, and then I was walking down the hall one day, 
and there was this tall African-American, beautiful Afro, walking down the hallway. He was a professor who taught ceramics. And I approached him, and he says, you know, I know you're taking art class. Why don't you take a sculpture class or ceramics class with me? His name was Ed Parker. Ed Parker began to invite artists over to his home, and he hosted an NCA chapter. And I met Michael Harris there and other artists that were all local Cleveland artists. And that was my first real encounter with, with artists of color. And on his shelf was a book uh, that I borrowed that was by James Porter, Modern Negro Art. And I still have that book. I never gave that book back to him. <laughs> and uh, so he was a very much an advocate of this. And his first job, Interesting enough, later I found out uh, David Drisco was uh, on the search committee and recommended him for a position at Fisk University when he was a young okay. professor. So this is, I mean, you know, no connection whatsoever. He hosted uh, James Van Der Zee the years before James Van Der Zee died. So he had a chance to meet James Van Der Zee and his wife and have some signed calendars and things like that. So here, what I'm suggesting to you is that it was a, a slow process and a long road, indirect, and I was reinforced, this notion of being an artist was reinforced by having met other individuals like Ed uh, Parker and others. And, uh, you know, at school there was no real material on African American artists, although Huey Lee Smith had studied at the Clayman Institute of Art, where I eventually went to study. And at night, I used to teach classes on African-American art history because I would study it right. because it wasn't present. And then the academic the historians at the Institute found out I was teaching classes at night with my <laughs> fellow black students. Well, you know, so, most schools weren't offering art history classes. Not at all. Not at all. So it, my, my career has been one, is, is, I think you could describe it as indirect. Uh, my being an artist had an entrepreneurial element to it because of the business. I've always appreciated that and I always wanted to own my own enterprise and my own business um, and be independent. And own my, You know, what it was is I, and, and, and artists, this is very important. I, I think I tried to speak about this yesterday. One of my, the greatest uh, assets you could have is ownership of your time. And you have it. Absolutely. And I watch you, how you operate. You have it. That was very important to me, so I was trying to find ways in which I could own my time and being of an course, artist. We talk about ownership of our time, but we're texting at eight o'clock in the morning. Yes, but you, you know? still you're doing that because you got to find ways to, the, the, to maintain that. How do you maintain that freedom and that choice? Right. It requires labor and work, and as uh, it's been stated, you have to put ten thousand hours in to <laughs> to achieve what you want, and that, that's part. I believe that's partially true. We put time in. And uh, the reason that's important because a lot of individuals don't put the time in. They want the results, right? but they don't put in the time or the energy or the sacrifice. There's a, a concept that we grew up with called delayed satisfaction, which seems to be a foreign concept to contemporary generations. This, this idea true. that I have to put it in, nurture it, and it will bloom but and blossom. we're both of the generation where we had, we had to write letters. Yes, you, you know, absolutely. We made phone calls. Absolutely. We didn't just sit there and text and email. Yes. So I'm not I'm not critical of a contemporary generation and that is the only thing that it concerns me or I in, I encounter is uh, how tentative things are, how uh, uh, transient things are, meanings are, how meanings change so easily. Uh, how there's such an unwillingness to look you directly in the eye, speak clearly to you, or to make work, to spend time and energy in the work, to have the work be substantial. So things are so tentative uh, with a lot of this generation, which includes a lot of young artists. The work is very tentative. Absolutely. Well, we'll talk. I don't even want to discuss NFTs because... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a lot of that's happening. What, what took you to New York City? And what year was oh, that? Oh, you know, it's interesting. I had... Uh, I had written a letter to Elizabeth Catlett. I met Elizabeth Catlett and her husband, and she became a friend of my wife, and they correspond with each other. And then I wrote Elizabeth Catlett a letter asking, can I come and study with her? And I never heard from her. And then I get a phone call one morning uh, from Bob Blackburn. He says, I understand you're going to go on a walk to see Elizabeth Catlett. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, well, I got this paper that I want you to take, materials to Elizabeth. 
I says, I, I, you know, I wrote this letter two years ago. I never heard from her. Oh, no, you're going. He says, call her right now. So I called Elizabeth Catlett, which made me a little nervous. But the, what, it, what had happened is that Elizabeth Catlett had spoken to Bob and told him that there's this artist, young artist, that I want, that wants to have an apprenticeship with me, but I can't host him because she has some uh, back issues, some surgery. Right. And I want to make recommend him to you, Bob, at the workshop, which she did. So Bob sort of got it all wrong. <laughs> but that's sort of how I got to New York is through Bob Blackburn. So I used to catch a train in the middle of the night in Cleveland, ride the train, arrive in Grand Central Station at 8 in the morning, work for two or three days, and then go back and forth. I did that for two years. <laughs> going and back what and year forth. was it? That would have been uh, 80... That would have been mid eighties up into I think eighty eight. That I did that at eighty nine. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Robin Holder was Robin there Holder, then. Robin Holder. Oh. Uh, was Melvin Clark there then? Uh, met Melvin Clark there. Ali was a printmaker. Uh, Otto Neils I met there. Uh, uh, Will Barnett I met there. All the notables passed. Yeah, yeah. Between there and Dorsey's yeah, Gallery Billups, in Brooklyn. Camille Billups. And, oh, Camille. Uh, all of that. Camille all of that. Yeah, they were all, you know, engaged with Bob. They were around. Uh, I didn't meet Beard in there. I had met Beard in before I got to New York at a at a place called Caramel House, which was a right. settlement house in yep. Cleveland. And I met Beard in there. Which is still there, isn't it? Still there. Still functioning. Still Amazing. operating. But I did, uh, you know, that was influential in my life. So what made you, you started out as a painter. Yeah, drawing and painting. Okay. And, uh, and now suddenly you yeah, want to do an apprenticeship to, making prints. Yeah, I applied to go into the painting department and they didn't accept me. They said, you can go into drawing. You're really good at drawing, but we don't have to take the painting. And that always irritated me. And uh, I got a, uh, I was, you know, involved with my community and there was a, uh, a political activist in the community named Tandy, who was from South Africa who was recruiting artists to make artwork prints, especially to help raise money for ANC in mm -hmm. South Africa. This is still during apartheid. And I volunteered to make a print. I had never made a print before. So one evening I went into the institute and they were working, students were working. So I asked them, I said, would, they help? would you help me make a print? I had started a drawing. So I did the drawing on the stone. I did some uh, Xerox transfers. It was called White Terms, and it had a, a fence, a barbed wire fence that was both in black and also in reverse and white as a bear between blacks and whites. Right. And their hands were reaching, but they weren't touching. So uh, that was my first print. You still have a copy of it? Yeah, I still have one of it. Yeah, that was my first print. Probably one of my best prints. <laughs> so I, was in, I was really intrigued by it because it did a couple things for me. One, it was very physical in the sense that you work with equipment and tools. And I was, I was, grew up with a, a, a father who, was, who worked uh, as, a, as a forger in the steel industry. So this physicality, this masculinity was, was always present. And uh, we weren't afraid of work. We were raised to be uh, with a high work ethic in my family. So uh, I, was, I was engaged in that physicality of that equipment and turning that arm and the, the, using your body as a part of the art making <laughs> process. And then, of course, the notion, as I mentioned yesterday, the notion of uh, creating works that be, can be shared with the community. Right. A very democratic uh, prospect of it was very intriguing because I would sell, I'd do an edition of 30 and sell all 30 for $50, make $1,500, and couldn't sell an original, you know, <laughs> because of the pricing. Right. So it was very, it was intriguing, the sensuality. Uh, especially when we're, my first piece was a lithograph, uh, the surface of a litho stone, uh, it's like the surface of the skin, like flesh. It's very, very it, sensuous. It's, it has a temperature to it. It's a, so this, this it idea has moisture to it. Moisture, deli <laughs> the delicacy of it, the sensuality of it, but the strength of it. You're working with a stone. Right. Was so in, has always been intriguing to me that those those contradictions, those tensions uh, were always intriguing. I love stone lithography and get to see so little of it. Now. Yeah, you just don't see much of it. So I, I, I love that. And it required a lot of science too because you know you have to work with acids and 
come here big and tush and all that. So it's not a simple little matter. It's complicated. Not everybody's able to do it. Do it well. They can do it, but not do it well. And uh, yeah, very satisfying experience. A lot of labor. I mean, I have scars from from that labor. You know. So, my, what what is your favorite form of print magic? Probably etching. Okay. And the toggling. Which also involves a whole lot of work. Yeah, acid, a lot of engraving, a lot of buffing with your hill of your hand. I studied uh, a la poupée, which is a, a coloring technique in Mexico. I studied in Mexico for a while. And um, then I studied book arts and paper making at, at Buffalo State University. So I did a lot of studying outside. I studied in Chicago, uh, again, book arts, binding. So I did a lot of things. I just. I wanted to continue to develop my skills in craftsmanship, but also I was still interested in mentorship, which is why I went to graduate school. I still felt I needed and wanted to be mentored by a mature artist, and and um, I was fortunate to have that happen. Who was the artist? Uh, this was Noel Rifle, who was my printmaking teacher, who made sure that after I finished studying in graduate school that I could set up my own shop, not just teach someone how to make a plate, Right. But how to run a shop. Uh, and then, of course, after that, they do what I call my master classes with Bob Black. Right. To watch someone who was with their sense of self authority, their uh, experience, the regard people had for him, his uh, uh, coming in in the morning and uh, solving problems in the studio, solving problems with a, a stone, having us. Uh, printer move out of the way so he could show him how to do it. And this is a master printer. Bob would show him how to do it. <laughs> and you're talking about someone who has studied with Augustus Savage, was right. his teacher, and Bearden, and, and Rauschenberg. So he was living history. Bob was absolutely, I mean, an internationally known. One oh, internationally, no question you know, about it. You know, and for and, a black printmaker you know. at that time. And I, I, I have been very fortunate in my life to have had the opportunity to, to have close collaborative relationships with a number of these artists that have been historical figures, whether it was uh, uh, Faith, uh, whether it was Sam Gilliam or David Driscoll or Rich Steven Antonakis or Richard Anaskavich. How did you get around to saying Faith make a print? Had she been, oh, had she I, made know, prints prior you know, to working she, with she, you? She was intimidated by it. She had made one print, I think, with Bob Blackburn. I sort of tricked her into it. She had did her lecture. She was a guest artist at Lafayette. She did a lecture. And part of the residency, visiting artist program that she was uh, engaged in, you would go to tours of each of the classrooms. So I knew she was coming to the print studio after her talk. So I had set up a plate on the studio, on the table, ground, needle. I had students sit around there. She's talking and she starts to draw. This is the first print I did with it called Anyone Can Fly. And um, she did that print. That was in '93, I think she did it. I didn't have, I didn't audition it until '94, but that was the first print. And I had printed with her for almost 20 years after that, and doing a new one now. Oh, nice! After you know, not working with her for quite a while, because she hadn't did much printmaking in right. the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I feel blessed to have been, and I don't know why that. Happened. Oh, in a sense, it, it happened because I made certain choices. I made a, uh, wrote a letter to Elizabeth Cabot. That was a choice. I received three phone calls in my life that were life altering. When Bob called me, when I got the job at Lafayette, because that was a phone call to the workshop okay. for a recommendation. And then a call I got later on from Faith. So I answered those calls, and I extended myself. I created, I, I engaged in uh, making the work and the labor without asking for any reward or compensation. Which is rare. And then I was able to work with these artists, and whatever I witnessed or heard or talked about never, you know, was repeated. So they could feel confident right. in that space. And some of them are private. You know, uh, so that has gone. That had. That's just my nature, and so by my personality, complemented 
this process, uh, not by design, but just by, by accident, perhaps. And we've discussed several times in interviews and, and you know, among clients and artists that most artists are introverts. Yes, I am a closet introvert. <laughs> closet <honest>. introvert. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's necessary for me to be an extrovert. I, I, do you, I, I mean, a, have you found most of the artists you've worked with Yeah, this reminds me, I did. A, I got invited to do a lecture at a, at a, at a college, a very famous college, a college that actually... Um, that Monia Lewis had studied that and then uh, got expelled from because of a <laughs> racial incident. Oberlin. So okay. I got a, I got invited to come to Oberlin College and do a talk. And I was so nervous that it was preventing me from getting, uh, you know, going up on stage and talking. And I got angry at myself for allowing my personality to get in the way of my opportunity. Mm. So that was a lesson for me. Be careful and make sure that you don't get in the way of your own opportunity. Right. So that was always important to me. So I was able, willing to do the work, willing to make the sacrifice, was empowered and, 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 and uh, uh, enriched by collaborating with other people. I was able to listen to these other artists. Uh, I was able to subjugate my own ambitions to fulfill theirs as a master printmaker because you got to deliver their right. aesthetic, not yours necessarily. Now, I know in some cases, some printmakers uh, in workshops, they get all in the business of the artist. They're controlling the artist, telling you what to do. We don't do this. What we did is to create the opportunity, provide all the resources, and facilitate. Right. And they would come up with whatever they wanted to come up with. It wasn't necessary for me to do that. Uh, so I, my, my ego was validated by the sort of transcendent nature of it. What I mean by transcendent, that whatever we were doing together produced something that we wouldn't have made individually. Right. How much did working with those artists inspire your painting and your personal work? You know, in my personal work, uh, it, it is working with artists in Latin America that's probably been more inspirational than any artist that I work with. David... Uh, working so closely with David and Faith, I don't think they necessarily inspired me as an artist, except for maybe David a little bit, because David's work is so romantic and sensuous. And I'm from the same kind of school, right. so we had a similar kind of a simpatico. And you both started of. out down south. Yeah, yeah. So we had this thing, this and, 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 this connection. So there was some osmosis, some influence that wasn't so strategic and direct. Um, but in Latin America, that was probably the most influential in terms of approach to the work, uh, the experimental quality of your work, uh, the significance of your work culturally, the practice. Because How many years were you at Lafayette before you set up the uh, printmaking? I went to Lafayette in 91, and I set up the workshop the summer of 95. So what were your early years as a teacher there like? Uh, I came, I arrived on campus with dreadlocks, a three-piece suit with a silk bow tie, and I was quite a present for her. You know, I was a grand poopa on <laughs> campus. Yeah. So it was an odd little situation because most African-American professors at that time, we're getting appointments for reasons of what we call diversity. I was a diversity agent. And the issue with that is, you've heard of uh, uh, what they call imposter syndrome, this idea that you come into that kind of white environment of the academy and you're not sure you belong, you're suspect, they don't believe you belong because of your credentials, but because of your race. This still happens in corporate America, it happens a lot still happens in an uh, in academy. So I had to negotiate that. And I realized early on that I'm among all these academics, Yale trained, Harvard trained academics, all the elite uh, credentials. But I had something that most of them didn't have. I had this innate creativity, this innate genius, uh, as well as knowledge from learning, from studying and reading and books and school scholarship. So I was not intimidated by it, you know, and I've seen some that are intimidated by it. Um, 
So it was a struggle when I first came to campus. They, the, the security would follow me around because they didn't know. It was me. the dreadlocks. Yeah, they were. It's <laughs> unbelievable that I was a professor. You know, that was difficult. It was only about, I think it was 97% or 93% white when I came to campus. I would get stopped by the police sometimes because they somebody robbed a store and they assumed if I was walking on the street, I was the one that robbed the store. Uh, you dealt with stuff like that. But uh, I had an opportunity to teach our story, our cultural perspective and experience, and that was valuable. Uh, I, enjoy, I enjoy teaching and inspiring young people and enabling them to tell their story, not mine, but their story. Uh, but that also ran its course. You know, I, I, I think part of the reasons I created EPI in the workshop was to bring in diversity Oh. which didn't exist there, to bring in collaboration, to bring in foreign voices that didn't exist. How did you manage to sell that to the university? I didn't. I was self-supporting. Okay. I, I raised my, they used to say that about me. Well, with Curly, you know, we know if we don't provide him with the funds, he's going to do it anyway. <laughs> so we, we generated enough through sales, and then I had a young student, whose parents were very supportive of him, and he wanted to be an artist, and I mentored him, and he's very close to me, so close that sometimes his parents would call me and ask me where he was. You know? <laughs> so I was like a pseudo-parent to him, parent to him, and they supported the workshop for for 10 years. Nice. How many they years bought, did you teach at Lafayette? I was there for 20 years. Okay. So they support. They bought equipment. They funded the residency program. Nice. They did a, a lot. Besides, we did sell prints to collectors. Right. We did some publications. I published a Faith Ringo for the Metropolitan, a number of museums. How so, did the uh, ML paper <coughs> come, come about? This is interesting. Uh, I did a, I, a Faith Ringo was was invited to do the letters from Birmingham for. Um, the Limited Editions Print Club in New York right. City with Sid Schiff, uh, which was quite a character. Was, uh, he was a uh, stockbroker. He uh, was a government official in housing and then an investment banker. And then he bought uh, Limited Editions uh, print, uh, Book Club and turned it into Limited Editions Print. Okay. And he wanted to work with Faith Ringo, so he called Faith, got in touch with Faith, and she said, well, you know, I have a printmaker, Curly. So uh, I met with him, and he hired me to publish the MLK papers. Mm -hmm. So I think it was eight images in the series. And then Faith wanted to do Declaration of Freedom and Independence, and he said that was too harsh for him. And so I said, look, Faith, I'll publish it. And so we did the edition of I think 20 in the edition of that. So, uh, yeah, we did over 40 editions together. Nice. And you're working on one now? Working on one now after, you know, a while of not working on the press. Can you we, tell us anything about it? Yes. Uh, Mama Can Sing and Papa Can Blow, which are very well-known pieces right. of hers and serograph. And you've had them in place one in the museum yep. for me. What we're doing, we did originally a diptych, a small diptych, and we're reproducing the diptych a uh, larger scale than the original diptych, etching and serograph, and uh, this is being published for uh, Dorian Bergen at ACA Galleries. Okay. So this is a commission. Nice. So, so they'll have the whole edition of it? Yes, they have the whole edition of it. Okay. We, Although I mentioned to them that, look, we'll publish the edition and this and give you half of it, and we won't <laughs> charge you anything if you let us have the other half. Uh -huh. And they said, no, we, we want them all. Well, ACA might have a couple things. <laughs> <laughs> they, so we want them all. So, uh, and they're, they've been always supportive of me. Uh, they've been buying works from me. And I think this is one of the ways in which uh, Faith helped uh, support the workshop is she required that they purchase the prints that she did with me from me, and they were her dealers, so she never provided them with her inventory. She right. kept it herself for the foundation. So in a way, she created a situation where I had uh, we had income, and she uh, bought us a small press, so she was very supportive. Nice. I've only met Faith a couple times at the Driscoll, well, at University of Maryland uh, Global yeah, Campus. Yeah. She's, she's been very supportive. She's a great person. 
Well, you all have a scholarship for Driscoll Center, right? In her name? Is no, we have a, we have a Faith Regal study room that okay, she funded, study room. and uh, it's for educators and kids to come in, and we're going to start hopefully this not this spring because of the perhaps COVID, but this summer we're going to have readings and storytelling uh, from faith books for kids, and then have seniors come in and actually make their own artist books and tell their stories. Nice. So we're looking at doing that. So you're at the Driscoll Center for a few more years. A few more years. <laughs> I'm preparing for that transition already, and that's uh, I think that's good. I mean that. that well, the uh, last time you retired, you were already at the Driscoll Center. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know? I retired from Lafayette, but I'm going to so think about my predecessors. I had two predecessors. Uh, the original director was there, I think, for two years, and uh, uh, they invited her not to continue. For whatever reason, I don't know the reasons. And then Bob Steele came in, and he was there for 10 years, and then just, uh, now said he was leaving and retiring. So there really wasn't, and they had did a search uh, that was a failed search, and then they asked me, I was on the board, would I step in for a short period right. of time, and it turned into, it's turned into over 10 years. But this is different, which means that I can prepare and plan for that successor and really invest in that. And then, uh, that wasn't there previously. And that's, so uh, there might be a better. woman director? <laughs> yeah, it might be a woman director. Yes, I think that's highly possible. And, and, and just maybe a little bit younger than you and Bob? <laughs> I think that's very possible. I remember Bob saying that he really had no plans on the center until David came to him and said, you got to do this. Yeah, yeah. Well, they came at him, you know. Because uh, so he think was retired. A, yeah, he was retiring. This is a. This is you know. I think uh, I'm glad on some on some level that I'm continuing for another uh, a year or two, so that uh, this transition after Derek, who's been there for quite a while, very instrumental in establishing the, the programming at the center, and it was good uh, to have a transition after she leaves, not to just both of us depart right. at the same time. So this time, are you going to really retire? No, no question about it. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I only, I was, look, I was supposed to retire. Not retire, I'm, I'm retired already. But I was going to leave my tenure to Driscoll Center at a birthday celebration two years ago for David Driscoll's birthday. Right. That was the plan. I announced my successor. But, of course, he, he unfortunately got sick and died. Right. And I decided to stay with the family's blessings for another two years so that there would be a smooth transition. So now that you're going to retire again, what yeah, are you going to do? Yeah, I'm going to call it retire, <laughs> yeah. Look, I've always run my works at my studio. Right. Uh, and my daughter is the managing director of it. And uh, my goal is to do a couple of things that I, I really need to focus on and will have the time to focus on is to expand my work, the workshop to uh, incorporate the entire property and that's the residence and the two workshops 